students I, I truly love. That is Penn State University, and even more than that, higher education, and what it has done for our society, and what it has enabled us to do. So I, I really appreciate becoming part of this Rotary chapter, which I understand is the 25th largest in the world. And uh, I appreciate the warm hospitality you, you have all showed me as I have come here to the York community. So now that I've ingratiated myself, let's get on to my talk. You know? And I hate to say this, but I have three themes. Uh, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about what is the land grant mission. Second of all, I want to talk about how Penn State University as a whole embodies it. And then third, I really want to focus on what Penn State York is doing to realize uh, how we can support the needs of individuals living here in the York community. So again, I apologize though for this first little bit because I am starting with a little bit of a history lesson. And when I mentioned this to Diane Moreno, she says, oh Lord, please don't do that. But <laughs> I promise to keep it short. Um, so just to talk a little bit about what it means to be a land-grant university. Colleges were first founded in the United States in 1630, 1636 at Harvard University. Colleges initially were focused exclusively on educating members of the clergy. I love this plaque that appears outside of the entrance to Harvard University talking about its original uh, mission. Again, this dates to 1636. It's a little archaic, a little hard to read, so let me, let me read it for you. After God had carried us safe to New England, and we had builded our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. One of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate <coughs> ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. So entitled New England's First Fruits. This was the origin of higher education in the United States. 1636 Harvard, 1693 uh, uh, William and Mary, Yale 1701 and Princeton 1746. However, as you might imagine, this limited role for higher education <coughs> had to evolve to meet some of the emerging needs in America. I love this uh, quote from Benjamin Franklin. An investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. So from the beginning, Ben Franklin, this great innovator, he honed in on the ROI uh, that higher education provides us. In 1749, he urged his fellow uh, Philadelphians to change the mission of what was going to become the University of Pennsylvania and expand it from simply educating clergy to providing the liberal arts and the practical skills needed to make a living and to perform public services. He created the notion of a curriculum of courses that would provide a very broad sort of education that would allow individuals to meet the emerging needs of society. By 1800, in fact, there were 18 colleges in the United States, and they enrolled a total of 1,200 students. 1,200 students were in higher education in the United States in 1800. That's less than 1% of the student body. And by the student body, of course, I'm not talking about all 18 and 24-year-olds. I'm talking about white males who own property. So higher education is for a very limited subset of individuals. The second great innovation, however, uh, that took place in higher education beyond Benjamin Franklin e evolving the curriculum to go beyond religious studies um, focuses on what Thomas Jefferson did in 1819. He got together with a bunch of his Virginian uh, aristocrats, fellow pres uh, former presidents James Madison and James Monroe, the first Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall to create a new type of higher education experience, and he did this with the creation of the University of Virginia. And here, he removed the religious studies from being at the forefront of education, and he looked at a series of different types of what we would call academic majors. He focused on things such as medicine, law, the classics, science, chemistry, and so on. But even these innovations weren't enough to meet some of the evolving needs for higher education. 
as the country expanded westward and the Industrial Revolution took hold in the United States. And so, in 1862, the U.S. Congress realized that there was a need for agricultural colleges to provide uh, support for food production and agribusiness. There was also a need to create a skilled workforce for the Industrial Re Revolution. And in 1862, an important bill passed called the Moral Land Grant, uh, Grant Act. Um, this uh, legislation provided for 30,000 acres of federal land for each state. The states would sell that land, and then they would use the proceeds to create a land-grant institution. As Tina mentioned, Penn State was the second institution to be accorded land-grant status. Uh, the first was the Mich uh, Michigan State University that beat us by 10 days. Uh, that's too bad. But the notion was that we wanted to have these land-grant institutions whoops, to expand the curriculum, expand education beyond what they called scientific and classical studies to include agriculture and engineering. And what is even more important than that, the purpose of education changed dramatically to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. Now, I want to take that last phrase apart a little bit. All of a sudden, education focused on liberal and practical education. So in other words, there was this notion that public universities should exist to provide the liberal education, the broad education that educated individuals need. But it had to be practical as well. This is what Franklin was originally arguing for. Education provides, you, uh, provides opportunities for you to make a living. Just as consequential was that last phrase. Education was expanded beyond that white aristocratic male elite. And there was this notion that we had to provide education to large groups of people, what they referred to as the industrial classes. So no longer was education limited to property-owning white males. Now it became the objective of the general public. And to a very great degree, this was the shift from viewing education as a private privilege, only according to a few, to a public benefit, to something that helped out society as a whole. So Penn State, whoops, we don't quite have the whole thing there. Penn State University, as I said, did become a land-grant institution in 1862. And so we're quite proud of our heritage. For those of you who uh, don't recognize this, this is the vestibule, the entrance to Old Main. And we see here this fresco of Abraham Lincoln, who was a president in 1862, as he's standing here uh, symbolizing the Morrell Act and the uh, land-grant mission of the university. Uh, for five years, the previous five years before I came here to Penn State, York, I had an office right there. It's just right outside. And so every day I got to go in and look at this mural, and I just absolutely loved it. It's a beautiful thing. So how does Penn State approach the land-grant mission? We really look at it in three separate ways. One is, the one is most obvious to us all, educating citizens. Um, we want to provide the education to uh, the residents of Pennsylvania. The second, challenge, or the second focus is addressing the social challenges that we have in society. We want to provide education to all individuals, that is access and affordability, and we want to focus to providing a low cost uh, alternative to higher education. And the third element, the one that I'll be focusing on primarily today, is promoting economic development in society. So just a quick overview of what we have going on at Penn State University. Uh, it is a single university and we have 24 campuses and this confuses a lot of people. People tend to think that we have Penn State University and University Park and then we have these smaller campuses throughout the state, but in fact it's considered to be a single university. We have a single mission. We all are supporting the land-grant institution. We have a single administration. We have a single president for Penn State University and then the chancellors at the campuses report directly to him. We have a single student body. Any student who rose at any Penn State campus is considered to be a Penn State University student. We have, a, whoops, we have a single faculty as well, single faculty body. We have a faculty senate, the majority of whom are not located at University Park. 
most because most of our faculty members are outside of University Park at places like York or Carlisle or Hershey. Uh, the majority of the faculty senate um, um, comes from the campus individuals. But most importantly, we have a single curriculum. If you take a business degree from University Park, it's essentially the same as the degree that you get from Penn State York or Penn State Baird up in Erie. And then finally, we have a single diploma. All of our students who graduate from the university are given the same diploma. It says Penn State University, and there's no locations. So the university deliberately structured itself in this sort of way so it could use its vast resources and push them out to the different campuses across the uh, state. And I just love this particular uh, slide that shows you that the light blue is a 15 mile radius around each of the Penn State campuses. And three quarters of pa Pennsylvania residents live within a 15 minute drive from a Penn State campus. And almost 96% of our residents live within this dark blue area within a 30 minute commute to a Penn State campus. And so what the university has done with this structure is it's trying to provide a high quality education to everybody regardless of where they live. They don't have to go to University Park. They can start at a campus or they can stay at a campus to complete their education. Again, this is part of our land grant mission to provide a high quality education to all residents of Pennsylvania <coughs> and as cheaply as possible. Uh, to, just to give you a sense of the reach of, of Penn State University, um, you see each of these dots represents a campus. Here is University Park, here is Altoona, here we are at, at York. But what a lot of people don't understand is that we also have 67 Ag Extension offices across the state. So Ag Extension to educate uh, farmers, uh, private individuals on growing crops, preventing disease, and so on. In addition to that, the university has located at each one of our campuses uh, what is uh, known as a launch box. It's a $30 million initiative by the university to create these centers to connect entrepreneurs and innovators in the communities with the Penn State resources. We have two specific Penn State University centers in the large cities of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia to support uh, urban development there. We have two OLLI offices. Some of you have heard of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute that provides for mature adults education and uh, social opportunities. Uh, we have one, of course, at University Park, and we're quite proud to have OLLI or Osher here located in York as well. Small business development centers, Shavers Creek, which is an environmental education um, office uh, near University Park the Justice and Safety Institute in which all of the deputy sheriffs across the state are uh, educated is located in the University Park campus and, and then finally the reach of Penn State through our television and through our radio. So I'm just trying to underscore here again how Penn State University is um, engaging the community across the entire state of Pennsylvania. And then finally one last slide uh, looking at the university's reach as a whole. We deliberately focus on providing low-cost education at our campuses that students cannot find if they are going to University Park. What you see here is the median Pennsylvania income in 2016. It was approximately $58,000. And then if you look at the bars going up across the bottom, these are each one of our campuses. So University Park, it, uh, tends to have students who come from families with an income of about $110,000. That's a lot, a lot of money. But we cater to uh, families that make less money who want to be able to live at home. The education at the campuses is different depending upon how large the campuses are. And as a point of comparison, if a student wants to go uh, uh, to Penn State York for all four years, he or she would pay about 33% less than the student who goes to University Park. If that student, in fact, wants to live at home here with her, his or her parents at York and go to college at Penn State York, they'll be paying less than half what a student would if he or she went up to 
University Park and was responsible for room board. So Penn State is aware that uh, we have families in different financial situations and we try to accommodate everybody as part of our land grant mission. But let me go on then to the third and the final point that I want to be making today where I want to put uh, the most focus. And that is, how does Penn State York itself achieve the land grant mission? How do we support and uh, our students? How do we provide that education that allows them to achieve their goals? And at the same time, support economic development in the region. <coughs> now, there are many stakeholders who have different perspectives on higher education. I've only focused on three here. I could easily add government, the taxpayers, and so on. But what I want us to do is to think about how we have these different interest groups think about what should higher education provide. They have different perspectives, of course, because they have different needs and expectations. So for instance, when students come to college, they're interested in specific subject matters. They have career goals ahead of them that they're focused on. They might have financial situations that will require them to uh, finish college quickly, or maybe they're going to have to spread it out over a series of years while they're working. Faculty members, on the other hand, who provide the education, who are the disciplinary experts, uh, have different philosophies on what should be taught to students and how it should be taught. There are also researchers at the same time because universities are expected to create knowledge. And finally, they have different expectations on how they should be engaged in the community. The employers themselves will have different expectations. They're interested in an educated workforce, whether these are students who are coming right out of uh, college and they start a job working at your company, or whether these are your current workers who need additional training that can be provided by higher edu education. So there are different ways that these three groups engage with one another. And I think it's symbolized well in this Venn diagram. If you think about, of course, students and faculty members engage with each other in the classroom. They engage with each other on individual uh, research projects. Students and employers engage with one another in internships, in capstone projects in which industry might approach our students and ask for them to do some research on a, on a vexing uh, question they may have. The faculty and employers, of course, of course, engage with one another quite a bit. We have advisory boards, of, and we have some individuals in this room who are on the advisory board for the campus, for our engineering program, for our GRAM program. There should be a lot of interaction that goes on. So it's quite obvious, though, that the education we provide for some students is readily translatable to the jobs that they engage in after they graduate. We provide the uh, training for accounting students to become <coughs> accountants or nursing students to become nursing. And I think it's quite straightforward what we're supposed to do with our education there. But what happens when you have individuals who are majoring in the liberal arts? That is, English majors, philosophy majors, people like me in the classics of all things. Um, as a matter of fact, these people, when they graduate, they do find jobs. They tend to go from one job to another, and these jobs are not closely identified with their academic major, but they develop the skills that allow them to flourish in the different jobs. This is an interesting chart that I pulled from the Wall Street Journal that looked at the jobs that our liberal arts graduates have after they graduate from college. Their first job, their second job, and the third job, and from top to bottom, you'll see uh, a, a, a descending percentage of students who go into those areas. So our liberal arts graduates, about 13% start in sales, about 11% start in office and administrative services and so on. And yes, you've heard that old story about the history major being a barista at Starbucks. Food service, there we are, 3.2%. But that drops out of the top 10, by the way, once you get to the second job. That disappears. And by the third job, it's long gone. Now, notice how the popularity of some of these jobs change. Sales is the most popular job for liberal arts graduates for their first two, but it drops down to the third. Uh, it drops down to second for the third job. 
education starts to fall off a cliff and the big gainer is marketing and advertising and 50 we see a 50 percent increase of liberal arts students who enter marketing and advertising as they are moving forward in their career so i'm really interested though in what we can do at penn state york to help out our graduates and succeed no matter what their major is no matter what area they want to go into and as part of our land grant mission we are specifically preparing college students with critical thinking skills, leadership skills needed to succeed in professional work environments. And so we have partnered with Don Graham to create the Graham Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. For all their strengths, universities focus or educate students in narrowly defined academic programs. If you think back to your, your academic experience, whether you're an accounting major or nursing major, it's a very narrow set of skills and content that you're being trained in. And you're not being prepared for some of those other skills that will allow you to succeed professionally. Mr. Graham approached the university, or approached Penn State York, and said he wanted to focus on those entrepreneurial skills, those leadership skills that all students in a professional work environment should have. So things such as uh, personal accountability, how do you become a self-starter? Your professional presence. How do you think innovatively? How do you work with others? And above all, what is the emotional intelligence you need to have to succeed in your job? Now, these are things that <coughs> faculty members really don't teach. We're focused on our academic major. But Mr. Graham really wanted us to think beyond uh, the narrow traditional academic disciplines and provide this sort of training that will help students, no matter their major and no matter the job they go into, prepare for the workforce. So there is a curriculum for our students. They take courses in innovation and in entrepreneurship and ethics. They attend a series of workshops and seminars. And at the end of it, they are in an uh, internship with one of our corporate partners. And we have multiple corporate <laughs> partners uh, in this room today. So, Mr. Graham approached us in 2010 uh, with an, uh, an initial investment that allowed us to create the Graham Center. Um, and in 2013, he increased his commitment to the university. And this allowed our students to engage in these deep learning experiences. What I'd like to show you now is a three minute video that interviews two of our Graham fellows who in fact have gone through the program. They are describing their experience working at a, uh, a financial services institution that I cannot mention uh, for SEC purposes, apparently. Um, but they'll describe what it is like to be a Graham Fellow. This internship was an incredible opportunity to go to school and work on a project within an industry that not many students are exposed to. I was interested in this internship because it gave me an opportunity to branch into a new field. Consulting, private equity, uh, financial services are things that students are often exposed to because they're things that you do after you graduate. Having the team approach this internship was amazing. <coughs> Having an engineering professor, Amy, she had the full professional aspect of it down. She knew how to talk to our representative at a conference call. She knew how to compose the emails. It goes back and nature. forth nature's way. And then having Ali was also a great aspect because he had so many different resources. He could explain the, the business aspects of the different companies. I think this is like 21 is too busy. I had confidence that they would be able to do the job well and it was a good opportunity for me as well to work with my fellow faculty member who's from the business department in marketing. So he brought a factor that I didn't, and together we worked with a very engaged client. What I learned is that my students, undergraduate students, who could actually perform this, it gave me a, quite a bit of confidence um, that, that what our students accomplished in this project and then now I'm in a better position to see what my students can do in future projects. It was very fortunate that our students as undergraduates had the opportunity to work with our client on a project that previously had been done 
by graduate level students from schools such as the Tuck School at Dartmouth and Wharton at Penn. And working with the Graham Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership Studies gave me an opportunity to work with them beyond the classroom. The Graham Center provided us the opportunity to go with the industry partner to a trade show right outside of Manhattan. We were able to attend this conference as a result of the generosity of a visionary endowment for the Graham Center. Being able to interface with people directly at the trade show, COVID and I, incredible opportunity. And COVID and I would bounce off of each other. Uh, the trade show experience was a wonderful experience. Going into it, I was very nervous because you're going up to these random strangers and just trying to get information about their company. And having that aspect and that confidence going out of it that you can do that and you can just walk up to it. At the end, we were so confident and we were really getting so much valuable information. The most valuable skill that I gained from this internship, I would say, is definitely working in a group, being able to delegate the work and work together, especially when he isn't here sometimes and I'm here sometimes, is definitely one of the biggest skills. And through the opportunity that was provided by the Graham Center and our industry partner. There's so many experiences that I think I've gained from this that it's, it's hard to quantify how much it's going to help me because we can go far, farther than I think we originally thought we could. So we're very proud of our Graham Fellows, but they only constitute about 6% of our student body. It's a very selective program. Uh, and starting in May of 2020, or in 2020, we will have a home worthy of this program. Uh, in April, we broke ground on the new Graham Center for Innovation and Collaboration. It's an 8,000 square foot center that will be transformational for the campus. It will be a permanent home for the Graham Fellows Program. It will allow us to expand the Graham Fellows Program to up to 10% of our student body. But just as importantly, it's going to be a base for all entrepreneurial, all innovative, all collaborative work on campus. It will be an opportunity for all of our students, starting as freshmen, to get involved in entrepreneurial thinking. Uh, it's a beautiful building. It's built next to our Pulo Center. It was designed by Frank Dittenhafer, Murphy and Dittenhafer. Uh, as I said, we broke ground on it in April. Um, right now it's a big hole in the ground, but let me just show you a few pictures of what it looks like uh, from the back. Uh, the main floor will have large glass windows that look north towards the city of York itself. Downstairs will have different work areas for students to meet with our corporate partners or to engage in collaborative work with one another. So we're very proud of this uh, building. It was made possible by the generous support of Don Graham, but also several local partners. Uh, Michael Haiti of Powder Mill Foundation uh, has helped support this building, as did Dave Meckley of the Wareheim Foundation and John Maria Pauly of uh, Reliant Student Transportation uh, contributed generously to it as well. And so, just to say uh, one last thing, I deeply appreciate your commitment uh, to the, um, excuse me, um, um, I deeply uh, appreciate your commitment to the City of York and we are delighted to be part of what we are in fact doing. Uh, to increase the economic development opportunities here in the city. Um, the role of higher education in the United States continues to change, and the land-grant mission of Penn State York continues to evolve <laughs> as we meet these new needs. I look forward to speaking with you uh, uh, about how you would like to partner with Penn State York as we go forward. And so thank you for your time. <laughs>